Stephen Roy Goodman, host of Higher Education Today. Welcome back to the education program that connects you to contemporary issues, people, and institutions involved in the world of higher education. Today's show is a special joint production of the University of the District of Columbia and the University of Cape Town. I'm here in Cape Town, South Africa, where we'll be talking about language and education. Professor Zubeda Desai is Dean of the Faculty of Education at the University of the Western Cape. Zubeda is a former chairperson of the Pan-South African Language Board. Professor Sean Bilhune is chair of the English department at Stellenbosch University. Sean teaches courses in literary biography, contemporary fiction, and globalization. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Well, thanks for coming on the show. Maybe if we can start with you, Zubeda. What is language study, and why is that so important in South Africa? Hello, Steve, and thanks for inviting me to the show. I think we can divide language study up into, into three sections, I would say. It's learning a language, so that's when, you, when, when one is trying to learn a foreign language uh, to, uh, to, for enrichment purposes. Then there is learning about a language, and that would be formal linguistics, how a language is structured or how a language is used. That would be social linguistics. And then there is learning in a language, that is using a language as a medium of instruction. And that's the area that I'm particularly interested in, when languages are used as a medium of instruction. And the University of the Western Cape, for an American audience, can you say a word or two about that and what language you tend to teach in? The University of the Western Cape started off as a university set aside for people classified as colored. But the university rejected that from the beginning and fought against that and opened its doors to students who were classified African, Indian, and colored, and, and some white people as well, you see. Uh, the university has seven faculties, of which education is one of them, and I'm the dean of the education faculty. And, and we teach the medium of English primarily, but there was a time when we taught through the medium of English and Afrikaans. But today it's mostly English. Primarily English, yes. Mm -hmm. And what about an Afrikaans speaker? How would they fare at UWC? African speakers are, are struggling, in, as, as are African language speakers, because English is not their first language. And I think that we don't give them enough support as, as an institution. And that's what I would like to talk about further. Well, fair enough. Yeah. And Sean, if we can bring you into this. Mm -hmm. um, you're at Stellenbosch University. Maybe if you can say a word or two about uh, Stellenbosch and then uh, the kind of work that you do in the English department. Uh, Stellenbosch University was uh, one of those universities uh, that the apartheid government uh, developed as uh, Afrikaans universities to foster both Afrikaans and the ideology that was uh, underpinning the apartheid state. Stellenbosch produced some of the architects of, of apartheid. And at, uh, when I joined the university more than a decade ago, there was still quite a, 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 a dominant a trend to, to teach through Afrikaans and maintain Afrikaans as the, the language of the institution. But now, there's, uh, through a lot of tension and attempts to reinvent itself, the university is aiming by the end of uh, this decade to offer all its courses through the medium of English, but also give students the option of having 80% of the courses offered through Afrikaans as the medium of learning. So it aims to be a multilingual uh, institution. I'm in the English department at this university, in some ways, these language problems don't directly affect me. All we do is through English. Um, but of course, the uh, very interesting tensions at the place about where it's going in terms of language policy does affect us deeply. Well, fair enough. I I if you were going to have a, a sandwich with someone mm. for lunch, mm. would you expect to speak with them in English or Afrikaans if you were in, at a dining hall in Stellenbosch today? The fascinating thing about it, unlike uh, at some of the sister institutions who are thoroughly uh, monolingually English, is that there'd be a switching of language or there'd be, I'd be able to have that conversation in Afrikaans or in English, or we'd mix, mix the languages. Um, well, but what about a student whose native tongue is, let's say, Kosa mm -hmm. or Zulu or Sutu? Mm -hmm. How do they fare in, at both your institutions? I think one, one shouldn't see things in, in uniform terms because one, when one talks about the medium of instruction, you can be talking about the language used in lectures, which often is English by and large. One can talk about the language used in tutorials. 
which could be English, Afrikaans, or Kosa, depending on who the groups of students are. We, one talks about the language used in texts that are provided to the students. One talks about the language of textbooks. One also talks about the language for, of the institution. What, which languages are used in graduation ceremonies, for example. So I think one needs to distinguish between the different domains in which language is used, you see. And those languages vary depending on the domain. Well, but let's talk about those domains. I think that's interesting. So there's the formal domain, perhaps, and then the less formal. Less formal. So in terms of the formal, I assume that we can track that pretty easily. But I, I think what would be interesting is to explore the informal. So how are students really communicating with one another when there's not an official uh, school function? They tend to use the language that they are most familiar in, and it's usually their mother tongue either Kosa or Afrikaans or Sutu, depending on wh where they come from, you see. And in fact, even in semi-formal situations, such as tutorials, when students are given a task to do, they inevitably end up using their own language. But their responses, their answers would be in English. But that's not crazy if you think about it, right? I mean, my natural inclination, I speak a little Spanish, uh, but I'm, I'm a fluent English speaker, and my natural thought is to think in, in English. But if I grew up speaking Zulu, why wouldn't my natural thought be to speak that way? Precisely, precisely. I think some, some contextual background might be useful here. According to the 2011 census in South Africa, the, the language that the, the, has the most home language speakers is Zulu, with 22.7% of the speakers, and that's followed by Kosa with 16%. English comes at 9.6%. Interestingly, a little increase since the 2001 census, that was 82 and Afrikaans is 13.5 in 2011. 13.5% of the speakers uh, speak Afrikaans as a home language. But they're all official languages. They're all official languages, I would say, in name only. Because during the apartheid, we had two official languages, English and Afrikaans. Now we have 11. So simple arithmetic tells us we should have a two plus approach. But in fact, we're having a two minus approach, where often English is the only language that's being used often to the detriment of Afrikaans as well. And do people f share that view in Stellenbosch as well? Uh, they do, um, uh, in that there is a sense that Afrikaans is under threat as well. I think it's recently been classified as an African, African language. language, which helps give it official status. But in the end, uh, what some of the uh, proponents of Afrikaans as a language of learning that Stellenbosch want to do is keep it as, an, as a language at an academic institution in order to help preserve it. My own view is that uh, you don't actually have to do that to preserve the language. I think Afrikaans is uh, hugely vibrant, alive. It has the backing of co Afrikaans corporations. And I think that would uh, ensure the survival of Afrikaans. It's widely used throughout the country. Just going back to your previous question, what would a Kosa speaker feel like at Stellenbosch? I think it depends on that student's background. If the student came from a private school, felt very confident in the use of English, Afrikaans, uh, it would the student would be fine. But many students coming from public schools feel both uh, uneasy and lacking in confidence about using English, and then they have to use some Afrikaans at Stellenbosch. So, uh, but the ethos of the place is also a problem. There's a perception that this is still a, an enclave of Afrikanerdom, uh, which in some ways it is. It's attempting to transform. So it's a fascinating institution trying to reinvent itself. And how would you compare Stellenbosch to, let's say, the University of the Free State? Well, the University of the mm -hmm. Free State has got Jonathan Jansen. That's a big <laughs> difference. And I think Jansen has the kind of character and personality and vision to, to really challenge what was at the Free State. Stellenbosch, we've been treading more softly. And so the battles are protracted and the positioning is very strategic on all side. So um, the transformation hasn't been as dramatic at Stellenbosch. Well, maybe after this segment, uh, they'll make you uh, vice chancellor of the uh, university <laughs> and you can push the changes forward a little bit. No chance. My Afrikaans is to slech. My Afrikaans is not good enough. And of official Afrikaans is actually quite daunting. Well, fair enough. And in terms of official Afrikaans, you're also an expert in literature. 
And maybe if you could say a word or two for an American audience about Afra Khan's literature and how we can read that in, in English. Uh, a lot of Afrikaans literature has been translated into English, so that's one one of the ways to read it. Um, there is a separate Afrikaans department of literature at the institution, as there is of African languages at the institution. And there's been this terrible divide in South Africa between English literature, Afrikaans literature, and indigenous literature. Um, in our department, one of the boundaries we've been trying to break down I are these barriers, and we encourage in uh, stronger comparative approaches, um, which wasn't the case in the past. So <coughs> as with other boundaries in literary studies, where in our department we look at the four pillars of what I think English departments in South Africa generally do, which is the British tradition, the American canon, the South African canon, which has been seen separately from the African canon. Um, and these are now being, uh, uh, you know, to what extent do we integrate them? How do we do that? And then how do we extend this to what our students are doing now, which is the oral, the visual, the performative, the creative? Um, how do we extend the idea of what is literature to include these domains? Well, you mentioned the oral. My understanding is that some of the languages are primarily oral languages. So, Zubeda, how would someone who has an oral tradition fare when all of a sudden we're focused on now written aspects? It's not that the African languages in South Africa are oral languages. They, are, they actually have a, 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 a written tradition, but people generally do not write enough in African languages. Unlike Afrikaans, there isn't a big literature in, in African languages. And as a result, the languages then don't develop, they reach a, a, a particular point, and then after that, people don't really use them, you see. So students, for example, use uh, African languages as media of instruction till the end of grade three. Then in e grade four, they suddenly switch to English. So then they're expected to learn everything through the medium of English. The English isn't sufficiently developed, but nor is the Xhosa or the Zulu sufficiently developed. So as a result, they're not faring very well at school. Our literacy rates are appalling at school level. And nor are they faring very well at the university level, you see. So I think that speakers of African languages have to drive the process. We can, I can talk about it, but I'm not the speaker of an African language. My first language is Marathi, an Indian language. So I think it's important that there's more literature in African languages. And there needs to be a government initiative around that to encourage people to write in African languages. But why does it have to be a government initiative? Why couldn't the universities collaborate and decide to do that themselves? It's not happening. It's not happening. And I think it needs to happen at a school level first before we tackle it at the university level. Universities can play their, uh, their part in encouraging that in the COSA department, for example. But they're not doing that sufficiently. There's a kind of attitude that English is taking over. So what is the point of developing African languages? And it's a view that I think is sad but I think it's a view that is quite dominant in the country. But you raise an interesting point that if a student is, is, is speaking one language and studying for a few mm -hmm. years, and then all of a sudden they're switching to English, you're essentially saying, if I understood you correctly, that now you have a student who's not particularly great in either language. Precisely. I could see why a government would want to get involved in mm -hmm. something like that. That's a very serious issue. Mm -hmm. But I wonder if this, is there a group of, of secondary schools or universities that might be able to take groups of students and kind of work on language issues? Well, I was involved in a project, the language of instruction in Tanzania and South Africa, where we extended the use of COSA as a medium to grade six, from grade four to grade six in maths and science. And at, at granted at two schools, and that showed that the students were able to understand science and maths better, and they were able to explain it in English because we gave them the materials in both Kosa and in English, you see. So th th that can happen, but it's happening on a very small scale. And as a result, it's not really taking off. There are pockets of people that are doing this throughout the country, but they're really pockets. Well, it's interesting in terms of what you're saying. Well, one, I think you're, even the way that we're communicating mm. right now, you're, you speak in a slightly slower way or I speak in a slightly faster way. Mm. So we don't know each other's speaking styles, and then on top of that, there are language issues. I wonder if that's also an issue in terms of lots of people who are getting together and talking, whether it's in a classroom or, or, or not. 
that is the, the situation and often in terms of turn taking it's a very interesting study to do in terms of turn taking in multilingual classrooms what i might think is polite to, to wait till somebody finished somebody else might not think that you see so i think it's a very it's a very interesting situation and i think it's not sufficiently studied in universities well, what the implications of multilingualism are for interaction at on a daily basis you see and the opportunity to be misunderstood but how would we do this in a literature context? I mean, this, 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 is, this is really interesting because let's assume that uh, I'm teaching an English mm. class. We don't have to assume that. Mm. Let's assume you're teaching an mm. English class. Mm. Can you assume that your students have the ability to understand the nuance or the nuances of different things that you're reading? Uh, that's the assumption we make because of that, that, that is what the discipline requires. We often have to work quite hard to get students who didn't uh, do uh, English as a home language at school up to speed to do that. But um, I find what we're not doing uh, very interestingly or we haven't till recently is use the capacity of our students who are Afrikaans speakers, many of them, who read in that literature in that language to say, well, you have this. This is the English literature we're asking you to study what happens when you put the two together? So that comparative approach, which we're starting now to encourage, we've introduced courses in translation. It would be largely Afrikaans, English, English, Afrikaans. But uh, it's an asset, you know. Having two languages is an asset, and I think that's the beginning of multilingualism. And we're now finally trying to, to encourage that kind of use of both languages. Just one last example of when I started 10 years ago at Stellenbosch, or more than 10 years ago, the attitude in my English department was when some student came to talk to you and asked you a question about, you know, where is this lecture, and did so in Afrikaans, you'd answer in English, and you'd in fact ask them to ask that question in English again, uh, believing that I suppose immersion is the best way to learn a language. Now what we've been doing is those of us who can and most of us can we respond in Afrikaans or we then switch to English but it's a sense to give value to this idea that having more than one language opens up more than one world to you so um, well in the United States we have a lot of these issues mm. surrounding yeah. Spanish and English mm. and for instance my daughter goes to a bilingual school mm. so she speaks English and Spanish yeah. fluently yeah. Some people would argue that that's bad on the grounds that she's not focusing on just one language. Mm -hmm. Other people would argue, you know, as I did as, as, her, as her dad, mm -hmm. that it's a good thing in that now she's learning both languages as she's growing mm -hmm. up. But I know there's some controversy about that. Mm -hmm. I, I think the context determines the success of a, a program like that, you see. If the teacher, for example, is both Spanish and, 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 and English speaking, is fully bilingual, then that program will be successful. But if a, a classroom in Kailitsha in the Western Cape, for example, the teacher is more fluent in Kosa mm. and not so fluent in English, the child won't necessarily grow up being bilingual. You see. So I think the context determines the success of those programs. I personally approve of those programs for, for the reason that you mentioned before. And it happened in South Africa in the 50s in, with Afrikaans and English. There was full bilingualism mm. then. And there were bilingual schools. So it's not a feature that is unknown to South Africa. So where, do you, where does South Africa go from here? You've got the official languages. It seems, if I understand what you're saying, is that it's working but not really as well as you would like. If you were the czar, wh what would you do? <laughs> if I were the Minister of Education. <laughs> Either one. Um, <laughs> I, I would extend the use of African languages as media of instruction at least till the end of primary school because I think uh, by grade age 12, 13, children's language development would have been uh, much more advanced than at the age of 10, at the end of grade 3. And then either carry on using the African language as a medium of instruction in high school or switch to English. But at the same time, I'm also not disputing the need to acquire English. English is a global language, whether we like it or not, and it would be foolhardy to deny children access to English. But you can also acquire English by learning it as a subject and it's taught well by teachers who are proficient in the language, you see. So I think at the primary school level, you learn, need to learn English as a subject very well, and then, then you use it as a medium in high school.
but at the moment they expected to use it as a medium from grade four and they can't actually speak the language at all. Do you think it's okay to learn a language by movies, watching movies and doing social things? I think all means can be used to learn a language but one ov obviously needs to distinguish between different dialects, different variants of the language but I think whatever tools are available one needs to utilize and I think it's important to hear the language being used but likewise it's important to read the language and very few of our students are reading. Uh, so I think mm. more emphasis needs to be placed on reading. There needs to be a culture of reading, whether it's reading on the Kindle, on your iPad, whatever, but you need to read, read, read. Well, mm. speaking of read, 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 as uh, when I got to South Africa uh, this time, uh, one of the first places mm. I went to was the University of Cape Town Library. And there are incredible facilities mm. at the University of Cape Town Library in terms of read, reading, reading. Mm. Uh, I'm assuming that not every library in South Africa is like that. Yeah, uh, you know, you have really well-resourced, well-equipped university libraries for the older established universities. We have, I think, a very impressive uh, set of, in certain urban areas, public libraries and a few of the well-resourced schools have libraries. But the vast majority of schools do not have a library. We started teaching at the same high school in the 80s, and one of our mission was to turn a classroom into a library. We tried, we tried, we, we failed in, in the end. But um, more important than that for me about read, 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 is reading begins in the home, uh, with the parents, with the children, and that's not happening in South Africa. Uh, to a large extent, that is really not happening. How can we... How can we generate that kind of culture of reading? I'm shocked at the number of friends whose children don't take a book with them on a holiday. You know, that um, my one-year-old child's friend can do this with a screen of her iPhone and look at pictures. Fascinating. That's reading. That's the beginning of visual literacy. And but uh, her eldest son didn't bring one book with on holiday. And uh, these are middle-class people. Um, so how can we have a Marshall Plan to get a reading culture in this country entrenched in who we are and how we live our lives? I don't know the answer to that if I were the czar, <laughs> but um, yeah, that's something we need to address. Well, if we can uh, take this to the university yeah. level for a second, mm. because I, I think your point yeah. about uh, taking a book on a holiday mm. is an interesting mm. point. Do, do university students do that? You, you make me think of a, a survey which one of my MA students is doing research on our 1,000 first years in our English 1 course to find out what they read besides their set works. Because we know some of them don't even read their set works. They pass the course without having read a book, <laughs> uh, which is an indictment on our course then. But the survey revealed that of the reading that was not part of their set work, the most popular form of reading was autobiography, biography. And we think this is largely of sport heroes or celebrities or political figures. That was followed by romance. That was then followed by fantasy. Then nonfiction, and I think lots of students like reading kind of scientific nonfiction. That was then followed by crime. Um, it was interesting to us that very few of them are reading what is conventionally called high literature. You know, would take Madame Bovary with them on a, mm. a trip overseas or, you know, on holiday. So that's the kind of reading that's very interestingly going on. What does that mean for us as a literature department? Do we begin thinking of how we can incorporate the genre into what we do? And of course, they watch lots of movies. They're far more movie literate than I am. So how can we use those capacities they have mm. to really look at film and look at it critically if they want to in the course at the university in the discipline. So as an English professor that doesn't inherently bother you to combine the visual and the written word? It doesn't bother me but it does bother some colleagues who feel that we're moving away from what constitutes the discipline and the discipline is textual and the discipline is close reading of those Texts that repay close reading. Um, so vis visual literacy might be part of a cultural studies department and we're not a cultural studies department. 
So there's a fascinating and I hope productive tension in the in the department, and I think this is happening elsewhere in the country, as to Ray keep us we keep asking the question, who are we? What is it? What is our discipline? What do we teach and how do we teach it? Fair enough. And Sudeta, do you agree with that? And do you have the, some of those same tensions going on at UWC? No, we do. And in fact, I would agree with Sean. But I would say maybe we need to use technology to our advantage and maybe use technology for books to be, to be able to read on Kindle or on iPad. And I'm convinced that children will start reading more if they have the, te the technology, the books on technology, on the iPads, on the Kindles, instead of the, the hard text, you see. Because I've seen little children actually reading on, on, on iPads and, and, and Kindles. Well, fair enough. Any and last I, thoughts that either of you have before we uh, wrap up this segment? I, I think we need to capitalize on technology. And so if I were the Minister of Education, I would see to it that every child has a, a tablet or an iPad. And I would throw in a good old-fashioned book as well. All right, well, fair enough. Let's hear it for the good old-fashioned book. <laughs> if you would like additional information about Zubeda Desai or Sean Filyun, please visit uwc.ac.za or sun.ac.za. If you have comments or suggestions about higher education today, please send an email to our viewer mailbox at highereducationtoday at topcolleges.com. Thank you for watching. We will continue to bring you quality discussions about important matters in today's college and university world. Please join me again for another edition of Higher Education Today. I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, and you've been watching Higher Education Today. Mm -hmm.